Welcome to deploying software using PowerShell Application Deploy Toolkit, or PS App Deploy Toolkit, or as you'll hear me talk, PSADT. Um, how many people here have used PSADT in the past? Uh, two. Anybody here? Three, potentially. Um, how many people are application packagers of any kind? Okay, just a couple more. And then the, the uh, response is, does anybody use, so um, I guess we'll go, just go from there. Introduction to PSAP Deploy Toolkit. It's a open source module, not really, actually, it's an open source toolkit that was um, developed by Sean Elis, Dan Cunningham, Mohammed Ab, and then a bunch of other people over the years. This was developed many, many years ago when PowerShell was in, almost in its infancy and they, were, they solved a problem. They were deploying software through SECM uh, I think it's SMS back then, but the idea that um, needed a standardized way in which to deploy to deploy software through those toolkits, right? So I say this is a, um, they have their own website, P PS App Deploy Toolkit, that they manage themselves. There is a module called PSADT on the gallery. It's actually not connected to them. And also, I don't represent them in any form. I was just a consumer of it, and I thought this would be a great talk to talk about. And I, a lot of, I like a lot of the stuff that they do in their module or in their toolkit and to go from there. So that's why I'm here. I didn't even talk about who I am. My name is Phil Bossman. I am a Citrix architect in the uh, Research Triangle Power in Research Triangle area, Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, my role is um, client systems. So I oftentimes deal with uh, delivering applications to end nodes but also primarily also delivering applications through Citrix. So that's who I am, kind of skipped right over that. But this is what PSADT is. The next question really is, why do I have to care about it, right? And so this is, when we're talking about PowerShell and a lot of kind of stuff, and you see other stuff, it's kind of, it's a framework, it's a module that we connect to other stuff. Well, this is slightly different in that regard. It's a bigger picture. It's an entire whole toolkit. And I say, and I like to use, the, I, I like the fact that they use the word toolkit because it doesn't match with most of us, what other people are doing with it, right? And so what problem does it solve? It solves basically a self-contained packaging tool, um, tools and commandlets. What was that? Um, structures, hello? I don't know what that was. What was that? Why is it beeping at me? Oh, we'll just see from there. Maybe I'm talking too loud. All right, so structured ex execution. So it's just PowerShell um, code. So it's PowerShell code in the way in which it's loading a bunch of stuff. It will define a bunch of variables for you. It'll define a bunch of functions. They package inside of the toolkit a uh, number of functions themselves. So they redo a bunch of the stuff that you normally would see. Hey, dealing with a registry, you know, new item, get item, and all that kind of stuff. You can do that but it doesn't follow into the toolkit and you shouldn't be using them, or you can, but you have to do a lot more other work. So logging, execution, output, they also included into the toolkit a bunch of GUI stuff. And so, hey, you need to prompt the users, you need to tell the user about stuff, all that kind of stuff. You, um, they give you that, those commandlets to do it for you. And so you don't have to worry about that stuff. The toolkit contains it. Like I said, it's a standard structure. It gives you all the components. It's also written in the form that there are config files. So you define the config file, uh, a bunch of other stuff. We're gonna go through that. This is what we're gonna go through and uh, go from there. It does have a component where they've actually released an EXE with it. So all the EXE does, it's a um, compiled EXE that just runs the PS1 right behind it. So PS1 is in the same folder, the EXE is in that same folder, run the EXE. So if you have to like right click run as admin or if you're using SCCM and you have to run an EXE, you can't just run PSL, PS1, run the EXE, which is right next to the PS1, and it will go from there. So this is this solves a unique problem. Yes, there are the other delivery and, and software toolkits. So this is, you know, to our great sponsor and you know, it's a great product, Chocolatey. It it doesn't solve everything that 
that Chocolaty does, and Chocolaty does different things. It's a different problem to solve. Um, some of these other applications, so SCCM, Chocolaty, other, are the delivery of the applications to the end nodes. This is just the package that you're going to build from there. So this just executes from there. So SCCM, um, Avanti, Landesk, those products deliver the applications, and then it just runs as EXE or PS1. So that's what this is. And let's see in action. Demo time. Demo time. Yeah, you know, I'm done with PowerShell. I'm a PowerShell guy, not a PowerPoint guy. All right. So what is it? So when you go and get it, it is, this is what the, I should scroll this down a little bit. I left this open. So if you had to actually get it from, you know what, let's go look at this first. This is the website that they, they manage themselves. So it inside their website has screenshots, downloads. There is a community forum in which you ask questions. They can think, hey, I'm trying to run this, that kind of stuff. So they do have a, their own small community to engage with it. They've been kind of dormant for a while, and they just started um, updating their code for recently. Um, they also have a donate, so if you really like the product, then you, know, you can always help them out. Going back to is how do you get it, okay? You can fork it right off of uh, GitHub. So this is the, the fork that they manage. So the current version is 3.92. That's current. It was 3.84 for a number of years, and now it's, now they've taken a bunch of fixes, and you can see that it's recently updated, not too long ago. And that's, uh, this is the day, month, year, so the European time which they do it. Continue on, so they have pull requests, they have issues, you can certainly come here in that dorm to get it. But if you're gonna fork it, it's good. here we go. So I point that out, this is their, this is the true source, and there are some people who have forked it, and it's, not, it's open source. So you may find other people who solve their own problems with it and do different things, and we'll get to some of that as well with um, what I'm saying here. All right, here we go. So when you get it, they have a bunch, they have some example code for you in an example section. They do have a docs. Um, but effectively, it is nothing more, there are all this other stuff, get ignore the project itself. But at its core, it is this folder called the toolkit. You notice inside of it, there are three files. Actually, I'm gonna kind of screw this screw up. Okay, so the config is just the, the exe, because it's a .NET application which then calls this um, PS1 file. We'll get to what that, well, actually we'll open it, and then we'll come back to. Then there is the toolkit itself. So there is, the structure is this deploy application.ps1, which gets run. It is the logic that you're gonna run, which then one of the lines in here basically goes up one folder, finds the app deploy toolkit folder, and then just loads the module from there. And you're like, well, it's just loading another module. Well, I can do that. Yes, you can do that, but then you get other stuff for free when you're doing those other parts, right? They have their own um, help mechanism for um, help. They will generate a GUI version of help, so it's not the standard um, PowerShell way, so it will give you a GUI. Let me do this. Well, we'll get to it. If I have to get to it, I'll get to it. I don't want to get off track. So the module itself, is this app deploy cool main, and that is the module, but I had mentioned also there is a config that you'll typically use, and uh, if you want to do any branding, there's you know PNG and you can do that branding. There's also an extensions section, so if you wanted to extend the application in any form, um, and I'll give some examples of what that is. And so we're gonna come here, I'm gonna use some base stuff. Everybody can see that code, is that good enough? Or is is that good if you want light mode too? I think that, let me know if that, that doesn't work for you. So a lot of documentate, a lot of um, standard stuff inside of um, common health, common based help. But it comes in, they start off with a um, standard of in which you deploy the applications. There's a default set of install, but you also uses a validation set of um, install, uninstall, repair, and I point that out because its default is what it comes with, but you change all this as we go along, and we're gonna work through that. So allow 
reboot pass through, whether it's term or services or logging. And so, yeah, these are just kind of baked in to the product itself. And then what you'll typically do if you get the actual package itself, you'll come here and you'll edit this section right here. Basically, define your application, give your name. You can use or maybe not even use most of this section. And then I typically come in here, when did I create it? And then who built it from there? Um, I'm gonna scroll through a bunch of this stuff because it's not really relevant, or at least it's not relevant enough to actually point out for now. Um, but it comes along here, and you can see at this point, this is where it comes along and invokes that other module. So we are gonna run um, deploy application.ps1, which is then gonna look, dot source the module itself. So then all the functions that are gonna be available in uh, main are gonna then come, come forward. And you'll typically wanna do that. So we'll go from there. Then it's organized into a bunch of other sections. So if you're the whole thing, all wrapped inside of here. It's not an install, it's not a repair. It's not an uninstall or a repair. It's gonna be an install section. So all the code for your installs are gonna be in here. Anything that you need to do for an uninstall is gonna be in here. And if you need to do a repair, it's in here. If you're not familiar with packaging, repair is simply a repair the existingly installed application. So if you needed to do that, because quite oftentimes you don't, you can't do a, a full reinstall on top of something that's already there. So there may be some logic in whatever application you're deploying. You need a different workflow. You need to not change something. You need to hold on to some other stuff. Um, there could be some flow that you need to work through. So let's just look at a standard install. Again, you come through, they added other sections for a pre-installation phase. If you needed to do any prep work, you need to do all that stuff, they create this section for you and it's just here for you to work on. So we have pre-installation, we have installation itself, and then post-installation. And so it's kind of funny to think like, well, I could just do that. But yes, now here's this template that you then, hey, every single time you, you're gonna, I need to build a new application, I need, I'm not really building an application, I need to, to build a package that then is gonna deploy some application. And so it's kind of this reminder, say, what do I need to do pre? What do I need to do during the install? Do I need to do anything post? Same thing, and we're gonna get to the stage of, same thing with the uninstall. Pre-uninstall, pre uninstall, and then post-uninstall. So it's, this is getting us into this standard form of doing some standard work, right? And repairs roughly the same. And at the very end, um, you see this, they're calling this custom function called exit script. And it says, hey, if it actually exited something, we want to then throw it and it will catch it and throw error messages at right there. Um, let me, let me just do this other thing. We did that, we did that. We are going to, so I had mentioned before is that this is, this is that secondary module that somebody um, developed that it repackaged their version, their version, but in a way in which it can be just imported as a module itself. And that's what we're gonna just import here. And you're gonna see, it's gonna do a bunch of fun other stuff. So out of the box, the code that you get from um, Dan and crew, don't, you can't just import that module or you have to import it with some caveats there. So this other guy who repackaged it and put it on the PS gallery, this is that version of that module. And I point this out because at this point, what this other module is doing is it imports it all into your current sessions so that now I can do, you know, tab complete. I can, you know, do other console level stuff. I can do, you know, execute dash and it'll complete the line for me. Otherwise, you need to do that kind of work yourself. Here we are. So here are the bunch of functions that we're gonna get to. I'm gonna kind of talk through some of them in a little bit of what's there. But it also, it does some inspection inside your environment and gives you new variables on what's happening. And so in this toolkit, it will inspect the environment and tell you what is there so that you can then use it later on for the package you're gonna build. And so if you needed to figure out, you know, the bitness of the application, of the bitness of, this, of the client, what's, you know, the, where's the log folders, where is temp folders, all that kind of stuff, it's all there for you automatically. And so it becomes for free, it, it, it becomes standard. So then is if you have multiple people doing your packages, they all know here's the variables that we're gonna use for this, here's the variables we're gonna use for that. 
you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. So, and if you're, the stuff we kind of defined in that config file version and all that that's there, other variables that are interesting, what's in the configs. Um, filter, deployment type, directory folders, files, support folders, um, that stuff. Go from there. Environment variables, is it a server OS? So some of these come, come along. So who's admin? Like, I don't necessarily know. So that means that when I ran this code, it's, it's automatically, there's a the default variable that for me. I don't have to actually run that other code that says, figure out, is, you know, so I have this role and all that other stuff, you know? Is server OS, and it defined it for me. And so it got loaded, it ran a bunch of code, that's what's actually in main. Main is there and it gathers a bunch of information and it throws it into your profile or throws it into the session. And so now you have all these variables available to you. It's hard to actually just enumerate the variables and that's why I did it in verbose. So you can see what's it importing and like that's what's there. Otherwise you just need to know it's there. So it's not very uh, intuitive at that point. But uh, the other module I imported, um, git command. Oh, I thought I imported the module. There they are. So again, similar to this is here. So we know we defined a bunch, we imported the module, and we get a bunch of variables for free. We also get a bunch of uh, functions themselves, right? So what's on this list that, that could be of interesting to us? So copy file, you're like, well, there's, there is copy item. But this is also going to add all the logging. So the logging that comes with you know, an MSI install and all that, all that goes into a, a particular folder. Well, then all my copies go in there too, right? Um, they created MSIs. Same thing, you'd be executing a process inside of um, PowerShell if you're really working with it. Just normally you'd say, you know, start process. In this, in this model, within this toolkit, you should be using execute process. Um, interesting enough, you can say get an INI file. So if you wanted to work with INI files, a lot of applications are using INI files for configs and, and input. You can, there's a, a wrap cap, there's a wrap application or excuse me, commandlet that will give you your, your INI data. It will give you registry values. So hey, if you want to work on the registry, it becomes real easy to play with the registry. You don't have to invoke other things. Um, I think, let's go to set. Um, it has a pre-can tag to run an SCCM task. So if you're using SCCM um, and you, you know the task ID and all that kind of stuff, it just comes along free. So you can easily you know execute that stuff. Uh, that's the other one I wanted to interest you is you can invoke a H key current user registry setting for all users. And so here's the things where it's like, hey, I want to do stuff in H key current user or other all users. And some of those other places where it gets kind of quirky as far as how to do it. They've actually taken that quirky code, packaged it up for you, and this is what it's for. You know, even install MSU updates, so um, Windows updates and stuff like that from there. Where else is on this list that was interesting that I wanted to talk about? Set active setup. If you do application installs and you're using active setup, there's a simple function to um, add content into the active setup keys. Uh, then there's a bunch of show stuff, and that's kind of the GUI stuff. That's kind of the fun stuff. And so, it, again, packaged for you, it will give you this GUI interface that users can interact with. So you want to send a welcome, welcome, welcome message? It will give you that welcome message. You want to give them an install where it, hey, do you want to install this application? Good to go. So we'll get to those as well. Setting registry, service start modes. You know, hey, you're going to get a service, and you have to do a bunch of code there. It's all here for you. And update the desktop, update group policy, and then kind of talked about it is write log. So inside your code, you can write the log where you want to go. Hey, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. Write log. All these other functions, be it copy items, set registry, it's using that function too. So then it's using it, you're using it, all the stuff we're doing all goes to the same place. 
So that was a lot about what you get from there. Um, I want to bring this down. Let's talk about that config file we talked about. So the, those variables that we got defined, a lot of those variables get defined here as well, or are, this is where that data comes from, right? There is an option in uh, PSADT where you can set it to you say, hey, you have to be an admin in order to run this. And so all that logic is here. So if you, need, if you want the user to make sure that they're running, run as admin to do this, you can do a full check right at the beginning, boom, add this to the config file, and now guarantee the application won't run if it's not running as an in, in, in elevated mode. Good for you. You can define your own, you know, if you wanted to specify what the temp folder is, what the registry paths for you know, doing stuff, where the logs go, all of that comes along. I kind of point those out because we're going to get to some code that I use in production and we redirect all this stuff. We don't want to use the, you know, the Windows directory log software folder. We put it in somewhere else because that's where our legacy stuff was putting it. So then all our applications from our previous scripts and all the stuff with PSADT all goes to the same place. Um, there is CM trace. So it, what it's using for logging. So if you're using this as um, a CCM as well, CM trace is kind of like the default log viewer, but you can also just write to standard text files and stuff like that. And so you just define what kind of style it's going to use. And it's just the format. Let's see what it is. So that the uh, logger can consume it. You can define what the log size is. So, you know, those kind of things if you're trying to play with some of those stuff. And uh, you can brand it. So, hey, instead of using those, the, the JPEGs that you're currently using or that, were, that come along with it, I want to define my own thing so I can do my custom branding. How's it going to be? All that kind of stuff for anything that's GUI related. And like, well, why is that important to me? Well, if we define it here in this config file, well, then it's used across the board. You don't have to change any of the code inside of, hey, if it's this module, I mean, excuse me, if it's this commandlet, it's going to look this way and I have to define where the graphics are coming. It's in the config file, it's all done. Um, there's a, a section for MSIs as well. And so you can easily define when we first saw before is when we do this install, the same installer, and we give it like it's a silent install. It will then automatically know that it's a silent install and anything we run from MSI exec, it's going to use that, those keys, right? It's going to use those parameters automatically. Or it will use these parameters if it's a standard install that's not um, that's in GUI form, if it's not silent, non-interactive, or if it is interactive, excuse me, if it's a standard install. What's your standard? So kind of in this fashion, you can kind of define what all those pieces are. And then again, if you have an MSI installed, it will always log to those folders as well. Another awesome thing which these guys put in automatically is their standard um, error messages, you know, any dialogue. They added an entire code for you that defined multiple languages. So if the you know the computer that you're installing on is of a different locale, it will happen automatically. It happens for free. And so that's why I really like some of this stuff. And keep on going. Default UI timeouts, some default timeouts. So what's the default timeout if you're gonna do an install, gonna do a deferral? You define here in this config file and nothing else. You don't have to go find those places inside your code where you're, you know, popping up here and popping up there. You just say, hey, it's a pop-up, and then let the, let the system work for itself. And you kind of saw here, we'll keep going down a little bit more. This is standard UI messages for in English. Here's, and they create basically um, objects here, so they just change out the code. If we scroll down a little further, all of these, and then Here's the exact same stuff, just translated for us, right? So you get all that for free. So automatically, hey, we do it in French. And then that's pretty much it. The rest of the entire code is uh, this exact same block, just in multiple, multiple languages. All of these languages, all the way down to Finnish, Hungarian, and Russian. Actually, oh, actually, it kind of goes on this side, all the way down to Czech and Slovak, and Chinese, simplified Chinese traditional. Kind of an overview of what PSADT is as a whole, and let's go actually. Um, yes. 
So, so what, what this is doing is simply saying that the you know, standard text error, that's the word error in whatever this language was, what were we? You know, French, Danish, right? And so you simply say, hey, I'm doing, I need a countdown. You see it here, it says, you know, the they automatically continue in, that kind of thing. So the variable, you know, that variable will continue in, in that language. This is that dialog box. So you can localize, or for free, you get that. In my environment, no, where everything is in English. But in some environments, there. So they wrote this to be this global environment so that you can do it, all that kind of stuff. And so I think we've gone enough with all of that, actually, you know what, let's actually, let's go see it in action. No, I don't, uh, oh, one, yeah, oh, one, oh, one, oh, one. So, uh, doo -doo -doo. we're gonna go to that same folder we have, and we're gonna go to oh, one. So, what we have here, you can see it both down there, but hopefully you can see it. Standard PS1, my EXE, um, Oh, I forgot to mention, it uses a structure. It assumes that there are two folders. Here, actually one back here, let's see. It wants to have a files folder and a support files folder. There's a structure inside the, the code is that it assumes all your installers are in files. Doesn't mean you have to be there. It just automatically defines this variable called directory files, and this is where that folder is gonna be, right? And so you then, um, don't have to do that. You can then say, hey, it's gonna be somewhere else, but then now you're you know, dot sourcing and you're trying to find the right code. Or you can say, keep the dir files, and that's where they, and the same thing, dir support folders, files, all the files are there. And so it's gonna keep those structured automatically. They don't give you those folders because you may or may not be using them, but if they are, they're gonna be there, right? And so the files folder should be the installs themselves, should be the installers, and support files are just everything else, you know, that's not directly. You could, um, some of our initial packages all just put everything in their files, and then um, there were times when we needed to just update the support folder files, and so it just made it easier just to break that apart so we didn't package it differently. So let's come back out. I jumped ahead. So what does it look like to actually run an EXE? So what this is gonna do is just simply going to install Chrome. Right? Oh, and then the last part. We'll look at the code in just a second. So I just double click the app. And this is my default GUI that we normally get. Right? So this is their branding. You can change the branding as you want. It says, hey, this is all of this comes along for free. So this is the application that we defined in that, that um, initial code. I can actually defer the application. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say defer. We don't wanna run this install. So if in SCCM I wanna just deploy, hey, run this on that machine at two o'clock. Well, the user's sitting at their computer and they get a little pop-up, hey, something's gonna happen. And we get a notification that, hey, the application ran. So it does do toast notifications, pops them up, and gives you users dialogues from there. So then, the user, then we're gonna kick it off again at four o'clock because they didn't run the install. Comes along, well, now you have two more times to defer. Right, so you have this dialogue message. You can even, um, with a config, or that config say, they're not able to defer at all. Or they can, um, there's a timer, you have to accept your response and so much. And you can even say, hey, automatically close you know, certain applications from here. But we're gonna continue on. And say, so you're gonna keep going. Oh, what happened? Mm -hmm. I will skip over. So we got some dialog box, we'll do an install and go from there. I'm not gonna worry about it for now. I'm not gonna worry about that part. So we're gonna come back out on to another machine. And so actually let's let's do a quick check of to what that code looked like. And so this was um, actually I don't really we'll just skip. We'll skip over it. So what did this look like for so yes, all those files, this is that folder. We kept the app deploy toolkit folder. We added a folder called files, and I simply took the deploy app applications um, PS1, and I just added this code here. I changed out this, and I didn't do anything, okay? 
So the last thing that, that this is the part where it said, hey, start the welcome message. If I had IE open, it would have closed it. That's what I forgot to do. How many, we're gonna allow the users to defer it. It's gonna defer up to three times. It's also gonna check the machine to make sure that it has enough disk space automatically based upon what was in that config file. So I can simply just say, check the disk space. And then it will always keep that prompt open for them. It won't let them defer it around. Then we went up to um, show installation. That was all pre-install. So again, this is pre-install work. Then it came into installation. Oh, that's why. Sorry, I didn't do that. I changed it out at the last minute to not execute the exe. I was doing, I changed it to the MSI version. That's what I mess it up. Because the file didn't exist. So why did I why why do I care about all this? I know I'm rambling here. But also in there, I skipped over before, it has a default function. I don't need to do any work because it's just an MSI. And it has a section to do MSI installs. So if you simply put an MSI into the MSI folder, into the files folder, it just automatically installs for me. It will run the MSI automatically based upon the config file on the config config, and we're good to go. We are going to defer again. Here's that same message. It's going to continue. I get this deploy, and it's going to install. So it now installs Chrome for me. Maybe I messed something else up in that file. I definitely know some others are working. So we can break out of those. So we're not going to do this one. We're going to skip over to the demo gods are killing me here. So we're going to do the same thing. We don't actually have to do MSI installs. So we're going to jump to this new one. Scroll, scroll, scroll. All this does is we use this in, in uh, our environment for ticketing machines. So it's just going to install some, fun, some uh, files to do fonts for barcode scanners. I'm going to scroll down to the installation section. We define the fonts we're going to use. Granted, we're going to use this default variable called your files. And that's the name of the file we're going to do. It's going to simply do co copy item, and it's going to write its own logs. Let's make this one happen a lot better. It was short shrinking for me. And so I keep jumping into these are just new machines. So these are clean machines. I don't have to resnap each time. Or actually, I don't think this one gives me any dialogue. Yeah, that was silent. Did I set this one to silent? We can check. I'm not doing too well here. Let's do Office. That'll be, I know that's gonna give us some stuff. Oh, so why do we wanna talk about Office? So Office is gonna be one where we can even have multiple application we're using. And so in Office and Cells, I'm not sure if you're aware that Office itself is packaged as an entire single date that file. And so um, what that means is that if you're gonna install just uh, Outlook, or you're just gonna install Word, hey, I just wanna put Word on it. It's the same bits that are gonna come down, right? It's gonna say, it's gonna get the, in technically, if you're doing it and you're getting it right from the cloud, it's only gonna pull the bits it needs. But if you're then in our environment, we need to push the bits to the client because we don't need to, we can't pull that across the wire for our deployments. So we deploy all the bits. And so whatever they need to install, all the bits are already there local for them. And so this is a two gig file, right? So we don't want to pull different things. And so if we need to install just Excel, we install Excel. If we just need to install Project Pro, it installs just Project Pro. Visio, Word, or the combination of. And then deploy application, this is just the generic default, and it will deploy the entire Office toolkit. So it will deploy Office 365 with Teams. This is the version we're gonna install, and that's me. Um, one of the other things is you can add your own code to it. We added a, an extractor, because one of the things also in, in our deployments, we extract it, we zip everything up, so if we have multiple installs. And so 
we actually deploy the payload itself, that's what it's called, and then we extract it to the directory folder, the files folder, as we see here, and so it gets there by default, so then we can use those variables. So that's just another method you can use. So we define, I'm trying to think, just looking through this. So in our pre-installation step, hey, whether it is non-interactive or interactive, we're gonna write a bunch of logs. If it's interactive, we're gonna use different configs, or we're actually, we're going to change the config of the XML so that it's gonna be full or not. And it will auto-close. It will auto-close um, all these following applications. Excel, da, 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 da. And you can see, hey, when it shows the welcome message, it will close those applications and it will do it silently. So it actually won't say, hey, please close the following applications. It'll just automatically die. But that assumes that this, they're already there. But most of it's because we're doing all this, they're not gonna be there. Scroll down a little further. What's it look like? Well, an app, a software, an office install is nothing more than setup.exe with, with configuring this config. And then we kind of talked about four is you can do different things based upon when this comes back, when execute process comes, it will give you a return code. And we then, if we got a return code that we don't know about, then, or if it, if it's a comes back zero, we then write to the log saying, hey, it was good. Otherwise, if we know what's gonna happen, we can then talk about the error codes that we're going to do, and we do a bunch of other stuff if we need to. Let's see, there's another script that runs it. I feel like I'm running out of time. This is just a reinstall, and un oh, the uninstall is the reverse of that, and that. So we're gonna do this, but we're gonna, I'm gonna go to O3, and we're gonna run this interactively, or non-interactively. Come on, open. That's not what I wanna do, but there we go. TS client. Um, I want to I want to show you this one. Deployment type. I'm going to say it's an install. Deployment mode. We're going to say interactive. I'm going to say well reboot pass through. Well, we don't care about that. But the reason I'm kind of going through that is that you can run this from the GUI at this point, right? So that's what I wanted to show here, all right? So we're gonna watch this thing run. But we're not gonna run or watch the whole thing. So you can see at this point, oh, like, you know, that's what you get for testing your, your, or messing with your code right before, or actually touching anything. Demo gods, I don't care, you guys understand what's gonna happen, it's not, it's, it's you understand what's gonna happen. Well, we're gonna talk about it, right? And so, you can see when it's running, it's developing all these variables that we kind of saw. We, we ran that, those modules just to do that for free so that we get some tab completion so we can get some variables. But this is what it's doing. It's coming through and it's um, get your default values. It figures out what your computer name is. It gets the current user who's currently installing it. It gets all these variables for you so that's how it's actually getting all this stuff, right? It does some inspection on the computer, figures out all these variables in which you can do, right? And so when you're deploying applications, you can use all these variables. And that would come here and where does it say? Because it does not exist. That folder doesn't exist. Support files. I mean, I want to see those things. No, this thing, this definitely, that's not, this does exist. Mm. Office profile says files. That file still exists. This file? Office 365 profiles. Okay, here come in really quick. So, we're going to debug on the fly. Here we go. Okay. 
Let me spit something. That's what it is. Somehow I renamed the folder. It's support files. Freaking A. But I think at some point I talked to some other people today while we were working and said, when you're working, blood on the screen, don't be afraid of blood on the screen. So interactively, come on. Hey, look at this. Oh, so <laughs> close. <laughs> so close. Oh, I know why. Yeah. So we're, jeez, my Christmas. Well, hold on. So the reason I say all this stuff, it's this fun stuff. Top right hand corner, that doesn't look like, like your other stuff. I now have the ability, again, we wrote some other stuff so that we can customize what those welcome messages look like. I don't want it in the center of the screen. I'm gonna stick it up in the top right hand corner. And I don't want this like deferral box. I want this little nice little graphic with the spin in it. All those messages I can I can do. So we define that 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 stuff, and now all my products come along with these dialog boxes over there. I don't get any toast notifications. I don't want any of that. That's not what the standard we want to use. So that can all come along with that portion. So the last part I want to talk about in this form, I appreciate your patience because I've just not been doing well, is there come along and open this up. So I told you I was going to talk about this other thing. In this application deploy here, we did this thing. We worked with this. Here's all these folders that I customized. We're going to use these folders instead of my logs. And uh, we're going to use custom folders. We're going to use these other icons. So this is how I'm changing out all those pieces, right? But I don't get that other dialog box for you for free, or I don't get that automatically. So they introduced this other mechanism called extensions. I did mention that initially, but there is this other thing called extensions. And so you can define your own functions that are going to be available for you inside of the application deploy toolkit. So you can say, I'm going to develop these other functions, the other commandlets that will help me along the way. Um, I think we're going to run out of time, so I won't show you, hey, we, you know, a custom extractor for some files and this kind of stuff. But in this fashion, I took their existing show install toolkit and show install, and I just made it my own version of it. So I copied their function, put it inside of here, and now this is my function. And as they update their code, whenever, when it came, went from version 3.84, I didn't really care. I just swapped everything out. I replaced this section of code inside the extensions, and everything's all the same. I didn't have to worry about that stuff. The config file, I had to rechange re a couple files. You know, I just add the stuff back to the config file, but otherwise it comes along for free, right? And so I added top right to my function automatically, and so then I can use it. So it's going to operate just like the normal, but effectively it's the exact same code. I added some, you know, figure out where the top right is and all that kind of stuff. That's all inside this code, and so. I made my own version of this, of their code, but I'm not, you know, inside the main working in there. I don't want to do that. You shouldn't be doing that. So you, you, they give you this ability to do it there. So, um, yeah, working from there. Four. People want to do four. I'm going to test our luck. I'm going to try four. Maybe we can get one more. Uh, no. You know what we're going to do? We're going to some things that I know. We're going to see. That was broken. I didn't. I rebuilt those VMs. Map data. Let me put that. These folders don't exist. That's why that other one failed. But I want to see something succeed for me today. I don't really care if it's going to go into the garbage because it's all there. I think that is the only thing I left to do and fix. So we're going to see something install. Something. There we go. All right, number four. Round four. We are going to go around four really quickly. Oh, did I create some port folders? We're going to go, yep. And we have just files. Yep, that, that one doesn't use files. Hopefully, we can make this work really fast. Let's get something. DS client. D. Uh, do do. Four. 
deploy application. It's an install, deployment type, interactive. Come on, baby. Uh, what's it not doing? Oh, it's trying to do the expand archive, but that's fine. It still didn't install because I didn't zip it because I left it all there. But you can see here we are. It, that's the other point. So here's the last part. And we're going to come with it. So CM trace, default log viewer. I want CM trace. These logs, and there is that standard where it's going to go. So at, as we can see in this log, Here's the installation stage. This is what, what it gives you more details in the log folder what's happening. And so at every stage of the execution, it tells you what we're doing. And this, you know, we're at installation, in initialization, then execution. If we're going to show a balloon pop up, it tells you when, what it's doing at that point. We don't care about that. It did that installation. Hey, we showed the dialog box. It deployed an application. This is the code we're running. Here it is executing into this working folder. And it's doing the work, and I don't really care that it's not going to finish because we're out of time. And it's going to finish. Here we go. I was hoping to get to this and then come back and go from there and watch it finish, but it's not going to. Really, it's a great product. I can use it pretty often. It is one of those things that can um, really help you. I really like the structured format and making it keep it you know, in the structured format. And it, some of the functions it gives you are really good. And I appreciate your time, and thanks to, uh, thanks for coming. Have a good day.